So I have to say to you that Mississippi has been very much on my mind these days. Um, there have been many milestone anniversaries this year. We've got the Freedom Summer, we've got the Civil Rights Act, the assassination of Medgar Evers, and many more things that we're celebrating in sort of 64. And, um, and I find myself reflecting on sort of the deep an inextricable link between access and content. And that for the last few years in our work, we talk about them separately as if they don't relate to each other. And, and in fact, we often talk about access as sort of the thing to go for and content as the thing not to touch, like it's the third rail almost in media justice work. And I think what strikes me about reflecting on, on Reverend Parker and reflecting on the work of 64 is their understanding of how these things are linked. Access and content. Just access and just content. I believe that they knew that what WLBT was doing was analogous to shouting fire in a crowded room. And we understand the regulation of speech in that context, but we don't think of the harm and danger that certain forms of speech, both the, the actual speaking of hate and then also the exclusion of voices and images that again create stories in people's heads about who's worthy, who's deserving, like, how did Kathy get inspired to become a lawyer? Who did she see on TV? How does that work? And who do our kids get to see now? And we think about the fight and the struggle and how that works together. The exclusion of our voices and the promotion of hate has helped to create an environment where certain folks' lives, black lives, people of color, and in many cases, many women's lives are considered cheap. Access and content operate together. Media justice requires we address them both. Renisha McBride, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Oscar Grant, John T. Williams, Henry Glover, Juan Herrera, Amadou Diallo, Iman Morales, Eleanor Bumpers, Vincent Chin, and the four little girls murdered in a church basement 51 years ago last month, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, Denise McNair. There are so many more names to recall. There are so many names we don't know. And they number in the millions over centuries as we are reminded over and over again that our lives are cheap. Continuing the legacy of Reverend Parker is to break the complicity of media, especially news media, but not just, with our dehumanization. Of course, media bias and defamation, they do not pull the trigger, but they do help paint the target on our backs. And we have a blueprint from the work of Reverend Parker and UCC, from the UN Human Rights Frameworks for Access and Service. And we can do so much better. And we can be so much better. And in doing so, there's the opportunity to make media worthy of the public's airwaves as Reverend Parker himself imagined. And I want to close with the words of one of Mississippi's greatest freedom fighters, Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer, whom Jeribu reminded me last night, um, yesterday was her 97th birthday. So, um, Ms. Fannie, this is for you. And, and you know she always had her way of just saying it. <laughs> and, this is, and this is it. She said, it's time for America to get right. <laughs> You know, that's the, you know, you and your mom and grandma said, just get right. <laughs> 
And as Reverend Parker and his comrades showed us decades ago, media justice, just access, and just content is a critical step in that direction. I am holding the vision that as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of this important decision, we will be able to say that all of us in this room and beyond helped America get right. Thank you again for this incredible honor. <laughs>